Yeah, but what's the answer y'all normally give? The one time I want you to say it, you don't. Church. Church, yeah. <clears throat> so you know where you're at, but why are you at? To worship God. <clears throat> yeah, to worship God. But what made you get up and come here to worship God? Because I wanted to. Why'd you want to? It's a thing to do. It's a lot of stuff, right? So we'll get into that as we move forward. But as always, we'll re go over Hebrews 10 and then we'll go on into Hebrews 11. They're both very long, so I'm going to read kind of quick through Hebrews 10 that we went over last week. And even though Hebrews 11 is kind of long, it's, it flows really quick. It goes really good together. So <clears throat> Hebrews 10. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Every year they would go and they would sacrifice animals for forgiveness of sins, for peace, for rain, for all kinds of other stuff. But it would never make the sinner who sacrificed them perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. If it makes you perfect, you just have to do it once, and then you're good to go, right? But you didn't. You had to keep coming back year after year. Because that the worshippers once perished should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So if I come back to the altar the next year to sacrifice another animal, it's kind of a... You admit your own guilt by doing that, that you have sinned that year. Therefore, you were not forgiven for it. Therefore, sin still exists and still requires a sacrifice year after year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. And that's why they had to do it every year. And they still do it to this day. This is a modern picture. You can tell by their hats. They got some weird hats, but they're modern at least. And this one's weird. They, they skewer them and stick them all down in like a... Y'all ever seen like a tan... Tan jury? Indians cook it in. They'll like skewer meat and stick it down in like a clay pot and cook it. Really, really good. I don't. They're not supposed to eat these though. I don't know if they do or not, but <laughs> probably do. Knowing them. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he say, a sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Again, coming from Psalms, as a lot of this does. Then lo, then said I lo, I come in the bottom of the book is written to me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Coming from, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of a book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. And here are the different offerings that have different meanings for all of it. The grain offerings, the goat offerings, or sin offerings, peace offerings, burnt offerings. They might know what burnt offering translates into. Anybody but Gary, because he pays attention good. <laughs> <clears throat> Holocaust. Holocaust. Yeah. Holocaust means burnt offering. Is that weird? Guess who named it that? They did. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So because God doesn't really get a lot of pleasure or even a lot of glory out of people sacrificing animals. And he doesn't get a lot of glory out of the death of meaningless things. Bulls were killed all year long. Sheep were killed all year. Goats were killed all year long. But they weren't killed on the altar or on the altar as an offering. But this one, when he came to do his will and in the body that he had prepared him, it completely did away with all those sacrifices because you don't need them anymore. By the which will we <clears throat> will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once. Don't have to do it anymore. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. It doesn't mean they burned a bull, took it off, burned a bull again as the same sacrifice. It just means that bulls, 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 sheep, sheep, sheep. If it's the same one didn't work the first time, they kept on and kept on doing it. This kind of just repetitive motion that didn't really mean anything. It couldn't take away sins. But Jesus came once and for all to take away those sins. 
But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. We'll go back to the covenant, because that's where it was said in the covenant, and that's what this is the fulfilling of the covenant. Saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of sin, remission of these is, there is no more offering for sins. The sins were taken away. They were taken away from everybody through Jesus. So now when you do it again, <clears throat> there's no more offering for that. You don't have to bring back a bull every year because you keep on sinning. Because what sacrifice can trump Jesus? What bull out there is so awesome you can kill it? Even hanging on a cross, do whatever you want to for all that matter. That could even equal what Jesus did. <clears throat> Nothing. He was the perfect sacrifice because he was the Son of God and was on this earth perfect to be offered for that reason. <clears throat> and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So now, the high priest doesn't have to go back into the holiest of holies once a year and sprinkle the blood, because now anybody can enter into it because you have the blood of Jesus, of the perfect offering to go in there. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us, a living, you don't have to do that anymore, the sacrifice, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. The veil was rent in twain as soon as Jesus died, both were done away with, old covenant had passed into the new, the moment that happened. You could argue that it passed into the new when Jesus was born. You could make arguments that it came as soon as Jesus started preaching and started drawing in all the people to the new ideas from the Hebrews through the fulfilling of the covenant or through the promises. But I kind of lean on this one right here because as soon as it was ripped and then everybody's like, oh, this was Jesus. And, you know, they had all that moment that everything clicked. And the ripping of the veil is kind of the symbol to that. That's when I kind of think it passed old to new because even Jesus, <clears throat> he got mad that they were doing the sacrifices not that they were doing the sacrifices, but that they were exchanging the money all weird for the sacrifices in the temple and selling stuff so people wouldn't have to bring their own sacrifices there. But even Jesus, once when he healed the leper, told him to go get the doves and go to the high priest and do the sacrifices as commanded by Moses. So with Jesus telling him to do a sacrifice, I don't think the old covenant was nullified yet. Or he wouldn't have said that, right? And because his blood hadn't been spilled as the ultimate sacrifice yet. That's why I lean this way, but you can... Look at a whole bunch of different opinions and stuff on that. but And having a high priest over the house of God. A high priest under who? Who is Jesus forever a high priest under? Chelsea. The order of? Melchizedek. Yes. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So it's okay to pick on people, so long as you're picking on them to do good things. <laughs> That's pretty much what it's saying, right? To provoke others, like make them do others. When they see you doing good, and let's say four people were doing good and one person wasn't, and they were all like, uh, you want to get up and help us, maybe? You're just going to sit there and like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll get up. That's a good thing. You can provoke others to do good work. I don't know if you can, like, pull out a gun and make them, like, go hand out food or anything, but I don't know how far it goes. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. It's a good time to be coming together. It's a good time to not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. After we received the knowledge of Jesus, which is the whole point of Hebrews, what they're trying to get across to these people. 
there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. <clears throat> you can't not go to church and be like, it's cool, I'm going to go burn a rabbit in my backyard. doesn't work anymore. But a certain fearful looking form of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries by not coming to church. There are sometimes reasons, I get it. But by just saying, I'm not going to church anymore, I don't need to go to church, I'll read a verse or two of the Bible once a week and everything will be fine. Well, you have a judgment coming your way, and I hope that that way that you justified it to yourself on why you don't need it works for God. I just don't have a lot of faith that it will. <clears throat> so... I don't want to down anybody for that or anything, anybody watching and stuff, but you got to go. You got to go. He said it up that way. Which shall devour the adversaries. Because if you don't go, you run really close to being in, with the adversaries. Because who else doesn't go to church? The adversaries, yeah. Who's team are you going to be on? Churchgoers or non-churchgoers? <clears throat> he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Very important, these two here. I'll read it all. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. What was the new covenant? We went from law to what? Grace. To grace. <clears throat> so now that you have the grace... And you decide, well, I don't have to sacrifice anymore, so I'm not under law. Now I'm under grace. So just ask for forgiveness of your sins, and we'll be all right. Or, oh, we don't have to go to church. Jesus will forgive us anyway. That's what he does now. We're all under grace, so we don't have to follow everything, the laws and the commandments that Jesus gave and that all the others gave. Well, back in Moses' day, if you broke one of them and two people saw you, they killed you. How much worse would it be that if you have the spirit of grace considered an unholy thing, wherewith it was sanctified, and hath not counted the blood of the covenant, and now you are trodden under the, son, the foot of the Son of God. Just read that backwards, you know, kind of give you the idea of what you're doing. How much worse shall that punishment be? A lot. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So you don't even want to run the risk of listening to yourself. For one, when you don't come to church, you are listening to yourself. Or you're listening to some, I don't know. I don't know why you'd be listening to anybody tells you not to go to church if you're a Christian. But you've convinced yourself not to go. And I get it. Sometimes you're sick, you don't come. Not what I'm talking about. I get it. Sometimes your car breaks down, you can't go. Not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you wake up, everything's fine. You're like, yeah, not today. You listen to your heart. That's what following your heart gets you. And that's why the Bible warns a lot against that. Disney will tell you something else. It'll say, follow your heart, follow your dreams. But the Bible's like, be careful, because our hearts are very wicked and twisted. So. But call to remembrance of former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Once they... It's not always been fun to be a follower of God or of Jesus, especially for these people. Partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. So, this is just saying a lot of bad stuff has happened to you guys so far. It wasn't always fun. You were slaves under Egypt. You had to wander in the wilderness. A lot of times God punished you for worshiping cows and stuff like that and different things. You were captured over and over again in Israel and Jerusalem and all of that. But, for ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have a heaven, in heaven a better and enduring substance. So why do they keep going even after suffering all of this? Because they knew they had something better, and cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. So, He's acknowledging they went through a lot of stuff, but he's acknowledging the why. It's like because you guys knew you had something better. You knew you had a reason to suffer all of this. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, 
and will not tarry. So they're waiting on it. They're waiting on somebody. They're suffering, but they're keeping their faith. Waiting on what? The whole point of this Hebrews is that you're, you're, what you're waiting on just came. It's here. Rejoice and keep going through that. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So now we have something to believe in. Now it was come. Now it's faith. Now it's the new covenant. Now you have the new believing of the saving of the soul. And that goes right along into boom. <clears throat> because it's faith now, right? Now. They already know and they've already seen everything that happened to all the forefathers, all the Hebrew forefront unto now. They have all the history unto now. The history for them is about to take a huge change and there's going to be a fork in the road. There were forks in the road before when they were going to worshiping Baal and going and doing all this other stuff, but this is the big one. So now it's getting across the point of <clears throat> faith. And what is faith? Now faith. What is faith? Why are you here this morning? It's not even the act of getting up out of bed, getting dressed, and going to church show that you have faith. Else you wouldn't be here. If you didn't have faith, you didn't believe in God, why would you go to a church? Why would you even waste it, waste your time, so to speak, if you didn't believe in it? Exactly. Why is it above all important in... Well, hold on, I don't want you to help yourself. <clears throat> now, faith is the substance of thing hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Tells you right there what faith is. Immediately. So if anybody ever asks, what is faith? You can say the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Simple enough, right? For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. In the beginning, there was a word... The word was with God. We all know that, Logos. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made, made of things which do appear. So we have faith that all of it came up, because nothing that came up comes from things that were already made up. That's a little confusing, but either way, the faith is pistis, comes from the Greek word, and it means the exact same thing, but it also calls it a moral conviction. You have a moral conviction because you have the faith. Because of a belief, you must do this. That's why you got to have a bed, a moral conviction. I want to go because I'm supposed to go. And if I don't, that's bad. When you ever lose that feeling, now you're starting to become what it was warned about in the last one. <clears throat> By faith, and here we, we're going through the whole Old Testament to show where faith was and why it was important. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Immediately through faith, Abel gave that excellent sacrifice, and so Abel got a blessing, and Cain got mad at him, and we all know how that went. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. What does translate mean here? It just kind of means change, transferred. He just went from being human in one second to whatever we become after it the next and went right on up. Didn't really have to die. Was not found. I mean, he was and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. God's like, oh, you please me, you're doing right. You are son of is it son of Seth? Son of Adam, I would have done this shit. I'm all forgot. Enoch. <clears throat> really close after that. Really close figure, and God said, just boom, you can come on up here. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. If you don't believe in God, how are you going to please God? Even if you do good, let's say I don't believe in God, and I go feed some homeless people and help somebody change their tire. Not a bad person, doing some good things, but God gets no glory out of it. Why does God get no glory out of it? Because you didn't do it. <clears throat> you did it from your own moral compass, which I'm not saying is necessarily that bad of a thing, but if you just get that moral compass, I've talked about this before, and you put a little bit of sanctification at the tip of it, 
Like, I'm doing this because God would want me to. Now, you get God's glory from us. Now, that's righteousness would be helping somebody in need as a righteous person. But if you take that righteousness and do it also because God had told you to be righteous, that is holiness. That's the difference there when you break through that. So without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that seek him diligently. So we know we come to church, we get reward. We know we don't, we'll probably get punished. That's where faith comes in. <clears throat> By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Faith and fear. Remember fear a lot from Proverbs? Well, now we're getting into it with Hebrews. But by faith, Noah being warned of God as of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Condemn the world. What if Noah wouldn't have built the ark? <clears throat> You think God would have flooded and killed everything? Even still? <clears throat> I don't know. Just restart. He would have had to drop a new Adam and a new Eve. I think he would have just kept going until somebody did it. But <clears throat> prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So faith got Noah on the ark and got us here, because at some point we all had to come from Noah again. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have after received for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. <clears throat> God said, hey, Abraham, get up and go that way. He's like, uh, I don't know what's that way. And God's like, I know, go. All right. And he went by faith, and look how that turned out. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of with the heirs with him of the same promise. So now Abraham got a promise, now his two sons have the promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. They were out looking for the land that God told them to go to, for the land they were promised. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. I was like, hey, I'll give you a child, but I'm too old. I'm God. Stop talking back to me. People have people done that a lot. I'm yeah. sure even we've done it a few times. But who was the child of Abraham and Sarah? Who was their child that's talking about? That she wasn't supposed to have. Jesus wasn't the son of Abraham. Because <laughs> she judged him faithful who had promised. Yeah, it was Isaac. Eric got it right. <clears throat> so therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. So many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore. So Abraham was as good as dead. He was pretty old. But then he had kids by Sarah. And through that seed or through that lineage line came everybody else, all the children of Abraham. This is just a real quick, this isn't 100% accurate, but it's good up to this point and it gets what I want to show across. Abraham had three kids or had three women that he impregnated by. One is Hagar who had Ishmael. One is Keturah which had some of their kids. And then by Sarah had Isaac, way too late. And then Isaac by Rebekah had Jacob and Esau, you all know them. Through that, by Jacob, through Billah, Leah, Zilpha, and Rachel had all these other ones. But through Leah came the line that eventually led down to Jesus. So it all had came by Sarah's faith to have Isaac. And that's where the lineage and all the seeds came. For generations and generations and even biblically, it says, as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. So it must have had a whole bunch of kids that went through after that. These all died in faith. Did they get to see Jesus? No. Did they get to see 
all the works and wonders that God was going to do for the people when it was finished. No. These all died in faith, though, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. We might not make it there, but we're going to keep walking and keep going until somebody makes it there. We're going to keep it alive and keep it going. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. You heard a whole bunch of hymns, a whole bunch of songs about wayfaring strangers and more pilgrims here and going to a country and all that. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. What stopped Abraham from being like, ah, we've been looking for a while and can't find it. Let's go back to where we were in our own, own land. No, that wasn't even a thought for them probably anymore. Like, ah, we're just going to keep going. That's what we do. But now they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared them a city. He invited them to that city that's going to outlast them, that they're going to make it to that one day. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he hath, that hath received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So that's saying that it will come back from the dead in what happened. That's where we get from Jesus coming back from the dead. But first, Abraham had to be tried. I will sacrifice my only son at this point to you. And then God was like, okay, don't do that. Here's a ram, but that's what I'm going to do. So if you're willing to do what I'm going to do, it's going to come through you, so to speak. That was the trial. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. So we started at Cain and Abel. And we're working our way down from Noah to Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Esau to Joseph. Showing how they got there by faith. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and were not afraid of the king's commandment. They were not afraid of what? There'd be so many dead firstborns this day and age. It'd be insane. <laughs> Think about that for a second. How many people would get out, kill their firstborns if they were told to? They'd go, oh, not me, not me. I'll never do that. We've seen you the past two years. We get it. We know where you're going. <clears throat> but I hope not. But they were not afraid of the king's commandments. Why? Because they had faith. And by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It, <laughs> choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures and sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of reward. He had everything there. He was like, I could be accepted as kind of the son of Pharaoh's daughter and just have live on Easy Street for the rest of my life. But no, I don't really feel welcome. I don't feel I feel something else pulling me towards these people where I came from. I'm gonna go with them. And he did. And if you ever look for a picture of Moses running away from Egypt, they're the funniest pictures. You'll ever find people when you, when you look at it. Look at this one. It's not my favorite one. I showed you my favorite one a whole lot. But I was like, why is this always so funny looking? Anyway, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured and seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So by faith Moses told all of them to do that. They kept it going. Why did they do that? If some guy was like, hey, go kill a firstborn lamb and smear some blood over your house or your firstborn's going to die tonight. I'm sure a lot of us would be like, that's a crazy person. That person is insane going around to do this. I don't even know that I would do that. But having someone who went through what Moses went through and someone who they've seen what Moses went through and they've seen all the things that were going on, they had the faith and they had a little bit more evidence than just someone popping up and saying that. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. 
which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. Think about how much faith you'd have to have to do that. It's two big, huge walls of water. You just seen them split. And he's like, all right, walk across. He's like, ooh, okay, here we go. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Who did that? Who was the leader when that happened? Yeah, Joshua. We read about that. It was trivia for a long time, remember? <clears throat> By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what? Well, okay, we'll stay on Rahab for now. Everybody remembers that story, right? Joshua was sending some spies to the city, and they were like, okay. Uh, they were discovered. Somebody said they were spies, but then Rahab hid them. But she was like, hey, because I'm hiding you, don't kill me when y'all come in here. It's a pretty good deal, right? I'll hide you. Don't kill me when you come back. So, all right, just throw out a red sash from your house, and then we, we won't kill you when they come back. And then the spies had to go back and tell Joshua, like, I don't know. I feel weird about that story because I know it's just have a different outlook, I guess. But in what more shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. He's just kind of making a long story short here. He's like, and should I keep going on on how faith has gotten us all the way down to me speaking to you right now? Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valley in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, not aliens as flying around, but aliens as people who were not from that land coming in. I see how some people could go crazy with that. But all these crazy and wonderful things that all these people did was all through faith. Women received their dead, raised to life again. But now we're seeing the flip side of that. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. It was not always fun. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. You know what that means? Sawn in half. Were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented so god's done all these crazy things for these people parting seas and delivering their promised lands but sometimes when you get away from it a little bit it's not always been fun sometimes some people have to go through the persecution of that those are probably the strongest people they could have been could have been rescued from it could have called on god for mercy and he would have probably spared them or made the death quick but they didn't why didn't they? To receive a better resurrection, which is something you probably won't fully understand until you're right there facing death. That's when it'll click to you. Some things you just don't see until it's right in front of you. Of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. That's where they had to live. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, still, after all that, Received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Why then now is this so important to them? And even now to us. Even with all those people suffering, even with all that faith of the fathers that got it up to that modern day when this was talking, still didn't get to receive the promise. But they did. They got Jesus there. Jesus came and was died probably within a lot of their lifetimes, is why I was saying that. So now they got that promise of the new covenant, of a new better way, of a torn veil that had one sacrifice for everybody, the blood of Jesus. So God having provided some better things for them, that they should, without us, not be made perfect. So if they just drop it all now, all that up to that point was for what? Would be for nothing if no one believed and had faith on the new covenant, on the new Jesus that was brought there and was foretold all the way coming up. So they were lucky. They didn't have to get cut in half for faith of a promise that they would never get. They got it. And a lot of them still didn't believe. But that was the point of Hebrews trying to 
Make them believe, right? That was Hebrews 11. Very good. That was long, but...